and gratitude to Dr. Alka Desh Pandey, Madam, for giving us this opportunity to disseminate knowledge all over the country <clears throat> about a very important topic uh, that is a ICP certificate course, thyroid and male hypogonadism. We have got two stalwarts of our API, Dr. Prakash Keshwani and Dr. Meenal Mohit, who are taking very active part and are part of this CME program. And I would like to thank them also for giving us this opportunity and to disseminate the knowledge to our physician and clinicians. Today we have got a very uh, first Dr. Meenal Mohit will be speaking on uh, thyroid. Uh, Uh, the uh, thyroid uh, pathophysiology, and eh? am I right? Yes. Yes. Today's topic is report interpretation, sir. Today's topic is thyroid report interpretation. Interpretation. That is the most important thing for a clinician. Reporting is most important. Many a times we see lot of discrepancies, and we ask, we blame uh, pathology lab for that. But we do not understand ourselves that there are so many things which are going on. So it is a very, very important topic. And I think the, uh, those delegates who are attending today's program will be benefited to a great extent. And then doc, we have got Madhukar Mittal, uh, uh, endocrinologist of All India Institute, Jodhpur. And then we have got a very senior and API stalwart, Dr. Rakesh Sai, uh, who is a uh, endocrinologist of great repute. And he'll be also be speaking on a very uh, about hypogonadism. So I request Dr. Prakash Keshwani to start. Thank you Thank so you much. Thank you, sir, for your nice word. You your words have been always moral boosting, and uh, we are uh, just uh, get, we always get inspired by your words. Dr. Mathur, sir, you will you like to tell a few words? Uh, thank you, Prakash ji. Good afternoon, friends. Uh, Honorable Dr. K.K. Parikh, sir, past president of API and a guiding force for all of us, Dean ICP, Dr. Alka Deshpande, course directors, Dr. Prakash Keswani and Dr. Meenal Mohit. Uh, I really feel privileged to be part of this third session of this ICP certification course on thyroid and male hypogonadism. I congratulate Dean ICP, Dr. Alka Deshpande, for taking this initiative to start this unique and innovative academic activity of the certificate course, which I believe will be of great help to practicing physicians and physicians in their day to day practice. My very sincere thanks to course directors, Dr. Minal Mohit, Dr. Prakash Keswani, for their sincere efforts and hard work in preparing the modules for these courses. I welcome uh, esteemed faculty of today's program, Dr. Rakesh Sahai, Dr. Madhukar Mittal. My best wishes for the successful program. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mathur sir, for your inspiring words. Madam Alka, can you please uh, say a few words? You have been the inspiring and uh, starting this program. Madam Alka, please. Yes, yes. <clears throat> yeah, when I thought of this program, I just put it to the faculty council and it was unanimously accepted. And here I must put it before all the participants that Dr. Minal was the first one who volunteered. She walked up to me and she said, Madam, I will do this course on endocrinology. I said, wonderful. And that was a very good beginning because immediately following her was Dr. Vishwanath on diabetic food, and then yourself, Dr. Keshwani. And I talked to Anupam, because I know Anupam personally and his abilities, and he also accepted. So it was a very good beginning. <clears throat> and as I was just saying, that I appreciate my course directors, the efforts that they are putting in, because it's not easy, even after 40 years of my teaching experience. When I go to take a lecture, I have to prepare for it. 
you know my father has always told me we can't talk off hand when we are giving a lecture because it is a serious job and therefore in my head or i am you know formulating that how i am going to present my lecture what will be the chronological sequence how the student will understand and that's exactly what two of you are doing so you have put in all your efforts and sincerity and that is what our participants are also appreciating reading their comments i am really very happy that all the participants are very happy with these courses they are getting much more than what they expected and with my experience i would also say that the stuff which is discussed here the <clears throat> topics which are discussed they are not only from the books they are added with your experience so they are converted into a wisdom and people are learning from your experiences that is what is most important initially people might have thought what is male hypogonadism but today they have understood the scope of this problem and they will be approaching the patients in the same way so both the i mean not only the course directors are putting in all the effort but even the participants are taking interest they are asking you questions they are sending you your difficulties all that i can see on the whatsapp and therefore i think the success lies in all this endeavor so that is our achievement together and we will work together even in the future so i must thank minal dr keswani and others for giving us this encouragement and opportunity and as i said earlier whatever these people are learning it is post doctoral they may not have to do dm endocrine but the whatever is discussed here is of the dm level so it's in detail that everything is discussed and that is what benefit the people and i said it in my first lecture also that there are many faculty members who are participating and that is how the knowledge will be disseminated to the budding doctors and to the students and therefore i am very happy that the courses are going on wonderfully thank you sir thank you keshwani doc thank you minal thank you dr parik and dr girish mathur for all your support thank, thank you, you so madam. much thank you thank you for your inspiring word and really these Uh, if uh, this topic will uh, uh, make they understand this top uh, to the participants and this will be helpful for the practice uh, in the practice also as well as for guiding the students as many of the faculty have also joined this program and you have been the source for uh, initiating this program and uh, icp will also be in, uh, remembered for this program And, and without delay, we shall start our scientific program. And uh, Dr. Minal Mohit, who is taking classes so very nicely, every time I ask him, ask her, why didn't she not join the SMS Medical College or as a faculty? Because she has very good teaching abilities and teaching thyroid uh, modules very well. And today's topic is interpretation of thyroid function test, which is really a big problem. and many of the time we get reports and we are not able to interpret them properly so dr minal please start with the your lecture so we thank can... you so much sir i'm humbled by all your kind words prakash sir kk parik sir grish mathur sir alka ma'am alka ma'am especially for giving me this platform i'm just a little sorry my you'll have to bear with me a little my voice might be a little problem today because i've just recovered from covid so uh, maybe my voice is not very good but please bear with it uh, can you allow me to share the screen ajay yes ma'am so the topic that we are going to discuss today is thyroid report interpretation i will begin with a very simple method and it will be a interactive session all through so i will request all the participants to actively inter, uh, participate to begin with thyroid hormones thyroid report interpretation we know the basic facts that psh and ft4 both should be in the normal range to label a patient as u thyroid so if the tsh is on the higher side and the t4 is on the lower side we call it a hypothyroidism 
If they change their positions and the TSH is low, FT4 rises, we call it a hyperthyroidism. With this background, we will just follow this checkerboard. Now we need to be very attentive here that this on the vertical axis, we have the TSH and the horizontal axis, we place the thyroid hormones. Both should be in the middle range to label a patient U thyroid that is normal. Now, if the TSH is here in the first box that is on the higher side with the low hormones, then this is primary hypothyroidism. If we have a thyroid hormone which is high, but the TSH is in the lower corner, then we call it a primary hyperthyroidism. So this much is clear. Now suppose both are on the lower side, the TSH is also low and the thyroid hormones are also low. That is the lowest corner, the left lower corner. Then we label it as secondary hypothyroidism. If both the hormones are in the higher side of the range, that is high TSH with high T4, this is the topmost corner right side and then we call it a secondary hyperthyroidism. So these are very simple diagnoses, primary hypo, primary hyper, secondary hypo and secondary hyper. Most confusing becomes when we find that the TSH is in the high side, but the thyroid hormones remain normal. So if only the TSH is rising, but the hormones are in the normal excess still, it is subclinical hypothyroidism. If on the other side, the TSH, only TSH is moving and it is low, but the thyroid hormone is still normal, we call it subclinical hyperthyroidism. Now, if suppose TSH does not move, the TSH uh, remains in the normal axis, it is only the thyroid hormone which is suppressed, then it is sick euthyroid syndrome or the non-thyroidal illnesses. Suppose the thyroid hormone is on the higher side, but the TSH is still in the normal range, then this can be mostly because of pregnancy or OCPs, or it can be a variant of sick euthyroid syndrome. So this checkerboard, if we remember, and we remember the positions, the report interpretations become pretty easy. This is the basic foundation of thyroid report interpretation. Another few simple concepts that I have discussed in the earlier classes also, maybe just to clarify further, that the movement of TSH and FT4 is always in the reverse direction, but the magnitude of movement is different. So for a hundred time displacement of TSH, the thyroid hormone displacement is only two times. So if the thyroid hormone range is from 0.4 to 4, the FT4 range is 0.8 to 1.8. So if FT4 is on the lower side, maybe say 0.6 or 0.5, so it's just two times displacement, but the TSH will rise almost 100 times. So we have to remember this, why this concept is important, because at times you will find that the FT4 is suppressed and the TSH is still not, not very rise. It's not proportionately raised or proportionately high. So you have to remember probably the movement is not proportionate. So is it that something, some component of secondary hypothyroidism is involved? So just to revise once again, if the problem is, this is the normal pituitary thyroid axis, the TSH from the hypothalamus, the TRH from the hypothalamus, TSH from the anterior pituitary, and the hormones from the gland, and then negative feedback suppression at the hypothalamic and the pituitary level. I'm going a bit fast because this we have discussed. Now, suppose the problem is at the gland level, the gland is not working. So the gland is not working. So the condition is that as the gland is not working, the hormones are low. So the TSH is rise. So this rise in TSH and the condition is primary hypothyroidism because the problem is at the glandular level. Suppose now the gland is overworking. So there is large amount of thyroid hormones in the system causing suppression of TSH. So there is again the problem at the gland level. So the condition is primary hyper. Now, if the problem is at the pituitary level, so there is no TSH. So there are no hormones also, but this is secondary hypothyroidism or central hypothyroidism. So with this background, we must also understand that the things are not that complicated. Central or secondary causes are less, almost 1%. 
99 times, 99 percent times, the problem is at the thyroid gland level, so it's primary conditions more commonly. And out of this 99 percent conditions. 80% of the time, the conditions are autoimmune. So it is either Hashimoto's, that is hypothyroidism, or it is Graves, which is causing hyperthyroidism. But 20% times, we do have non-autoimmune conditions. It can be goiter, it can be subacute thyroiditis, it can be thyroid nodules, it can be thyroid malignancy. So with this background, what do we need? What do we really need to do? We need to assess the thyroid hormones, or do we need to do just a TSH? If we go for thyroid hormones alone, we can go for that, no worries. But there are some lacunae. At times, because of the rise in thyroid binding globulins, alteration in protein binding, causes of non-thyroidal illnesses, there can be conditions when even FT4 can be misleading. Conditions like NTI, that is CQ thyroid syndrome. We may fail to identify the subclinical conditions. So alone measuring thyroid hormones is not sufficient. We have to have a TSH as our foundation diagnosis. If the TSH is raised, we know it is over typo. If the TSH is not is raised with a not very high value, less than 10 maybe, we are dealing with subclinical hypo. If it is normal, it is euthyroid. If it is marginally raised, we can deal with subclinical hyper. It can be over hyper. But alone TSH at times is again not sufficient because we might miss the cases of central hypothyroidism. So we are always advised to do a full thyroid profile or a coupling of at least TSH with FT4. So these are the conditions where we should be looking for a paired assessment of TSH and FT4. If the TSH is normal and you dismiss the case, you might be missing the secondary cases. But if the TSH is raised, then you assess T4. If the T4 is low, you are actually dealing with primary hypo. If it is normal, you are dealing with subclinical hypo. If it is elevated, then probably you have to screen out the TSH secreting tumor, which is a very rare entity. If the TSH is low, and then you look for FT4, which is also low, then you are dealing with central hypo. If the TSH is normal, we are dealing with either a T3 toxicosis condition, which is again a very rare condition, or you are dealing with subclinical hyper. If the T4 is raised with a low TSH, then you are dealing with hyperthyroidism. So this is TSH driven testing. This is how you basically test. First, you ask for a TSH and then you, according to TSH, you take your call. Another important thing which you need to remember is that once the TSH is higher side raised, it has crossed the border, it becomes subclinical hypo. Now, these patients, over the period of time, they turn either hypothyroid or they might even revert. But this takes a lot of time. Years it might take. So you have to keep these patients under your follow-up. Similarly, the same condition for hyper, subclinical hyper, you have to keep these patients under your follow-up. It takes years to become over hyperthyroidism. So... These are the conditions with this background. Let us come to our first case. Now, all the participants, the diagnosis will be coming from you. Now, this is a 38-year-old gentleman, IT executive, complaining of tiredness and weight gain. Routine screening tests done and a dyslipidemia or a lipid profile was also done. So this is the report. T3 is 1.2, T4 is 3.8, and TSH is 35 milli units per liter. Diagnosis? Hypothyroidism. Primary hypothyroidism. Primary hypothyroidism. Very easy, very simple, correct uh, interpretation. The learning point here was that we also did a lipid profile because of hypo, primary hypothyroid also gives us a dyslipidemic picture. So this patient will have a decreased HDL and increased LDL along with increased PG. So another learning point is T3 1.5, T4 10.1, TSH 3.5 milli units per liter. Diagnosis? Primary thyroid toxicosis. Diagnosis is? Primary hypothyroidism. Primary 
thyrotoxicosis. Maybe the patient is on replacement Both. therapy and the uh, patient is developing thyrotoxicosis. Thyrotoxicosis. Ma'am, uh, uh, let's have a look again. The T3 is normal, TSH is normal, T4 is normal. This is just a symptomatic patient, a young male patient. So the learning coils, symptoms of hyperthyroidism are mixed up with anxiety disorders. There, are, there can be signs of hyperthyroidism. So we should always keep hyperthyroid differential diagnosis in mind. So the typical symptoms can be weight loss, increased appetite, hyperdefication, sweating, palpitation, goiter. Women can present with high, uh, bleeding, like period, uh, menstrual disorders and with uh, hyperthyroidism, mostly there are delayed periods and with hypothyroidism, there is menorrhagia. There can be mood swings also. Then there are signs of hyperthyroidism. We might have a gland enlargement. There can be brewy present. Then there can be system organ disorders. There can be adrenergic symptoms like palpitation, tachycardia, cardiovascular, neurological symptoms. There will be ophthalmopathy. There will be dermopathy. So not all features may be present, but some of them can be present. This woman presenting with eye signs, you can see the upper sclera, you can see the limbus, uh, upper limbus clear, the sclera present that there is a delayed lag, and the lid lag is there. There is pretibial myxedema, this is a dermopathy present with hyperthyroidism more commonly. This is another misnomer, we label it as pretibial myxedema, but this finding is a feature of hyperthyroidism, though we use, it, uh, use the word myxedema because of the edema present, the subcute edema. But this is not a feature of hypothyroidism, but this is a feature of hyperthyroidism. This is a typical dermopathy of hyperthyroidism. Again, where you see the phalangeal enlargement, the thyroid acropachy is there. So the differential diagnosis of hyperanxiety neurosis, there can be FAO, there can be internal malignancies. The patient can be on OCPs, there can be secondary hyper or there can even be iatrogenic, that is overdosing of hypothyroid patients or it can be factitious. So this was our learning from case two, that we don't need to get biased because we are sitting in a thyroid class, so there can always be other differentials also. Coming to our third case, a 62-year-old female admitted with episodes of abdominal pain Routine investigations normal, all imaging normal, tremors noticed, hyperthyroid on lab workup, TSH is less than 0 0.05, T3 3.2, and T4 is 16.1. So that learning point here is that we can have at times some atypical presentations of thyrotoxicosis, Though the pain abdomen is heightened anxiety in thyrotoxicosis, we do not have really a cause of underlying pain abdomen in thyrotoxic patients because these patients are always hungry and they are uh, hyperdefecating. There is less acid formation. So acidity is not a common cause of pain abdomen in uh, hyperthyroid patients. It is the heightened anxiety. Then there can be Dr. other... Minel? Yes, ma'am. Dr. Midal, can I just add? Yes, sure, ma'am. Please go yes, ahead. Yes. Every thyroid problem, I would classify as that we have to look at two things. One is the morphology of the thyroid. And for morphology of the thyroid, we do the imaging. You can do either a nucleus scan, sonography. These are the two most common modalities. And then we see the function of the thyroid by using the uh, thyroid function test. Now, in a Graves disease or hyperthyroidism, most of the patients, they have thyromegaly. And therefore, we have to also examine the thyroid. We have to examine the thyroid. Now, and that will be a morphological evaluation. Now, you have a Graves patient and you can't see a goiter in the neck, then you have to go and look for a retrosternal goiter. So that's all that I wanted to add. So it is a morphological evaluation and a functional evaluation. Thank you. Very correct, ma'am. This is what I, uh, when we look for clinical examination, the approach to thyroid is always in three parts, the functional, anatomical, and etiological. So whenever we look for the functional part, we look for whether the patient is euthyroid, hyper, or hypo. Then when we look at the anatomy of the gland, we look for the size of the gland. And when we look for the etiology, we look whether we are dealing with a benign condition, or malignant condition, 
or is it an online tool or we are dealing with some deficiency disorders so that is how we always approach the patient so when we approach the patient we approach functionally for the clinical and then the biochemical so that is how we approach the patient so with that i come back to my original presentation yes so these are the some uh, confusing presentations of the thyroid thyroidoxic patients they might present with abdominal pain they might present with cardiac failure and there can be at times par paradoxically weight gain patients and also constipated patients now these are the uh, as ma'am said we have after my biochemical testing the patients now we have certain cases where we prefer going for imaging studies that we, that is we require radio imaging or we require isotope imaging we also at times go for antibody assessments and others so when we go for radio imaging we are practically doing clinically all 99 technetium per technetate uptake only because it has a short half life and we get the reports on the same day we are and they are, they also get this technetium also technetium per technetate this also gets concentrated in the thyroid gland just like the iodide so but we are not using iodide because it has a long half life and we do not get the reports in same day so conditions which will have an increased uptake this is important to remember that there are conditions which will have increased uptake that is most commonly the graves and all the toxic adenomas it can be toxic uh, single adenoma or it can be a toxic mng or it can be a tsh producing pituitary tumor all these conditions will have a increased uptake now there will be thyrotoxic condition with low uptake because as ma'am you will agree the most important question that our teachers are always asking what is the difference between thyrotoxic and hyperthyroid so all thyrotoxic patients are not hyperthyroid so thyrotoxic with condition with a low uptake will be like subacute thyroiditis or it is exogenous hormone uptake it is ectopic ovary metastatic follicular ca or radiation thyroiditis all these patients will pick, uh, will come to you with a clinical picture of thyrotoxic state but it is not the gland which is over functioning but it is because the hormones have been released into the system and as a result there is overburdening of the circulation with the thyroid hormones but if you go for a uptake scan the technetium uptake scan you will find that the gland is showing a low uptake or a decreased uptake so this is the picture this is isotope scan this is a graves disease where you will find that both the thyroid lobes have increased uptake whereas in case of a thyroiditis you will find that the salivary glands because we always compare the uptake with the salivary glands here the salivary glands could not take anything everything has been taken up by the gland because the gland is overactive here it is thyroiditis the gland is finished the gland is not working so the the uh, technic the 99 technetium uptake has been done by the salivary glands only the thyroid has not been taking anything so this is a typical radio imaging of a thyroiditis picture where you do not need to treat the patient with your uh, anti thyroid drugs you just need to wait for the gland to finally give a picture of either a hypothyroid or may patient may become euthyroid <coughs> sorry whereas in a graves disease you will treat the patient with either of the approaches that we will take in graves disease class so coming to the fourth case now a 33 year old lady presenting with isolated thyroid nodule from 3 years now she has a nodule which is almost painless that is why she has been bearing it for 3 years and clinically she is pure thyroid so this is a patient <clears throat> what would you do what would be the next approach for a thyroid nodule she is she is thyroid radio iodine uptake ma'am correct so radio iodine yes correct as rightly said we will go for a scan and you okay. find that the scan will give us what this is a youth thyroid patient so what are we expecting we are expecting either a cold nodule cold so, yes if it is we what we are expecting is not a toxic nodule because this is a clinically youth thyroid patient biochemically youth thyroid patient so we have just gone for a scan to find to rule out a cold nodule we were not looking for cold nodule we did this scan to rule out a cold nodule but unluckily it came out to be a positive cold nodule cold nodule means a nodule which is likely to be malignant it is not a 100% rule that all cold nodules are malignant no it is not so 
whole nodule is just an indicator that this might be a malignant nodule. So the next step would be to go for a either FNAC or a true cut biopsy. Another case, same age, same profile, 33 year old female presenting with a single isolated thyroid nodule again. But this time it is a short story, short history of three months, again painless, but the patient is clinically thyroid toxic. So you find a thyroid nodule, which is toxic. So again, what we do? Thyroid scan. The scan. Perfect. So we do a thyroid scan. And this time you find what you are looking for. You're looking for a toxic ah. nodule and you get mm. a toxic nodule, correct? So this yes. nodule is toxic. It is not the entire gland. It is not an autoimmune condition. It is not Graves. It is a toxic thyroid nodule, which needs either a surgery after establishing a U thyroid status or it requires ablation. Again, after uh, for ablation, you don't need to make a patient U thyroid. You just need to stabilize the patient clinically and then you can send for ablation. Okay. Now coming to our algorithm for nodule because we have discussed two nodule cases. Just finish them here. Thyroid nodule with a normal TSH. That is a U thyroid nodule. Go for FNAC or go for ultrasound guided biopsy. If it is non-diagnostic, if FNAC comes non-diagnostic, you can repeat it. If it is a patient coming to you with low TSH, then you go for a technetium uptake scan. If it is a toxic nodule, you go for ablation or you for, go for surgery. You can choose to treat with antithyroid drugs also. If it is a cold nodule, again, go for a biopsy or FNAC. If it comes out to be a cyst, you can choose surgery. If it comes out to be a benign nodule, you can wait and watch. You can try a thyroxine suppression. If it comes out to be a suspicious, doubtful, malignant, either of the things, you have to go for a surgery. So that is a standard algorithm followed as a gold standard. The incidences are that 4% of the nodules are malignant, 10% will be doubtful, 70% will be benign, and mostly the reports comes as non-diagnostic and you need a follow-up. Now the antibody testing, the thyroid report interpretation of antibody profile. Most commonly, we send a TPO profile that is anti-TPO antibodies. TPO and TMA are the same things. Sometimes we use the word, some labs are using the word microsomal antibodies. Some labs are using the word peroxidase antibodies. So TMA and TPO are the same things. Another antibody used is a thyroglobulin. <coughs> Sorry. In hyperthyroid patients, we are using the TRAB antibodies or the TSH receptor antibodies. This antibody screening is not of great significance. You will find the columns that these antibodies are even in the general population and general screening, you will find that almost 20 to 25 percent of the general population can have them positive for no reasons. In first degree relatives with patients with thyroid dysfunction, almost 40 to 50 percent of the first degree relatives can have these antibodies positive. So these antibodies do not have much significance and they should be taken in the perspective that if you are dealing with a subclinical hypo and the antibody is positive, then follow them up and treat them. In pregnancy, if the antibodies are positive, then you can treat the women. So there are very specific conditions where these antibodies are of having some therapeutic value. They do not have much therapeutic significance other than ruling out the autoimmune picture. Now coming to the invasive procedures, that FNAC value and the true cut value, the biopsy values. Suppose you have a lady, now this is a 44 year old female presenting to you complaining of breathlessness, routine workup normal, and she's euthyroid. Now this is what is something, uh, which is a learning example because this was a real life case. Now this lady, let's see again, 44 year old female, typical Indian woman, 44, middle-aged, coming with a vague complaint of breathlessness. Everything normal, euthyroid. Looking at her, any ideas, any diagnosis? Okay. Look Congrats at the neck. the neck. Yeah, look at the neck. Just focus the neck, this portion. Sorry. Look at this, this portion. See. The thyroid region is full, it's bulky. 
and a just chest x ray was done not by us but by a pulmonologist because of breathlessness because we dismissed the case saying this is youth thyroid it has nothing to do with us and then the chest x ray was done by a pulmonologist and can you see the huge gland this is a retro sternal extension above the heart the lungs are clear nothing to do with the lungs nothing to do with the cardiac shadow also but a huge thyroid shadow which is behind the sternum so this is a huge thyroid sternum so this is the pressure picture this is a pressure symptom over the compression of the trachea causing dyspnea strider causing dysphagia there is dysponia so that is retro sternal extension ambulton sign yes that will be uh, just displayed so after the sonography was done the sonography scan ct scan to find out the mediastinal extension and then a surgery was done of course and a post surgery the ct picture of a u thyroid lady this is the pemberton sign asking the patient to hold the hands above the head for 30 seconds and you can find the subclavian compression causing the blue discoloration of the face so the pemberton sign was positive and this was the operated huge thyroid gland which was taken out and she was fine coming to our seventh case of the day now 65 year old men i have another 15 minutes sir i will try to find uh, fin finish up up with the cases so this is a 65 year old man he was admitted in the intensive thoracic unit with septicemia routine thyroid function done t3 normal t4 normal tsh normal no overt clinical features of hypo or hyper so if you review the t t3 is on, also on the lower side the tsh is in the normal range but the hormones have moved a little to the lower side so if you recall the checkerboard you will find that the tsh remaining in the normal range if you want me to go back to the checkerboard then this is a sick u syndrome that is a non thyroidal illness because of the septicemia the tsh has not moved but the thyroid hormones are suppressed so this is a non thyroidal illness the sick u syndrome the most common type of sick u is a low t3 80 80% of the cases the low t3 t4 states and the tsh remains normal the treatment is you do not treat mostly you do not treat it is just the treat the primary condition but if the patient is really bad t4 is very very low you if you treat thyroxine for a short time it might help recovering the patient from the non thyroidal illness also coming to the eighth case 25 year old female known case of graves now there will be a series of pregnancy and thyroid cases so this is a lady she is planning pregnancy on anti thyroid u thyroid at present known case of graves so what will you recommend she is ma'am on on which anti thyroid drug that is not important she is still planning pregnancy she is not okay. pregnant Okay, so okay. what is important here is that we can always ask that if she is still planning pregnancy we can ask her to mm. complete the course or complete the anti thyroid drug course establish u thyroidism withdraw the drugs and then plan a pregnancy she is still 25 the time is not running out or you can ask her to ablate the gland if it is not uh, if there is a recurrence and then plan a pregnancy after 6 months this is the learning point here that a lady who is not yet pregnant just planning pregnancy comes to you intelligent enough to come to you then you can always give a right counseling suppose a case 9 a 28 year old female already pregnant primary gravida with a tsh of 0.01 with a ft4 normal diagnosis nothing is to be done it's a suppressed tsh due to pregnancy first correct. very correct very correct so we are dealing with a hcg causing suppression of tsh so we do not treat this this is a normal thyroid report of a pregnancy case number 10 a 25 year old female again a primary gravida clinically hyperthyroid this time tsh suppressed and ft4 raised now it should be ruled out for the twin pregnancy you can consider a twin pregnancy very correct but still she is hyperthyroid she ha has hyperthyroidism already established 
if if ma'am she is in a first trimester then we can start with the ptu otherwise new merkaz or second and third trimester very good very good very correct she is definitely over hyperthyroid gravida so we start with ptu if it is a first trimester if it is a second trimester we can even start with new merkaz all and we can continue with new merkaz all but the learning point i will come to you the for the learning points another case 11 and 12 combined same profile 25 25 year old female primary hypothyroid on thyroxine replacement planning pregnancy or or otherwise already a pregnant lady primary gravida but a, a hypothyroid on thyroxine replacement the learning message is that the tsh is some suppose a primary gravida with a primary hypothyroid tsh 15 or maybe 65 whatever learning point is never advise abortion we never advise abortion whatever the case we always treat as as early as possible and try to establish u thyroidism as early as possible in pregnancy the condition is that the thyroid hormone are, are coming from the gland and the tsh is from the pituitary coming but this tsh is suppressed because there is a drop in tsh because of the placental hcg which stimulate the gland also there is increased estrogen there is increased thyroid binding globulin so the total hormones are raised we always assess ft4 during pregnancy also there is increased iodide clearance during pregnancy as a result also there is a hormonal report interpretation difficulty so during pregnancy there is increase in the thyroid gland size a little increase in the total hormones increase in the binding globulins but the free hormones remain normal if there is hypothyroidism the demand of the gland the demand of the medicine that is thyroxine replacement will be increased throughout the pregnancy whereas in hyperthyroidism the anti thyroid dosing will be decreased during the entire pregnancy throughout the pregnancy we will try to keep the patient in this range that is the tsh in the low normal range and t4 in the high normal range both should be in the normal column but tsh on the lower axis and ft4 on the higher axis so even if you are treating with ptu just give the dose that keeps ft4 in the high normal side and eventually go on tapering it to maintain it in the high normal range if you are replacing thyroxine also try to give the dose in anticipation that the dose will be increased the demand will be increased throughout pregnancy and as the pregnancy is advancing try to maintain the ft4 in the high normal range so this is the differential of hyperthyroidism in early pregnancy yes if somebody rightly said it was multiple gestation so subclinical cases we do dismiss we do not treat it can be multiple gestation it can be mild hyper msis hyperthyroidism overt again it can be multiple gestation it can be transient thyrotoxicosis of hyper msis but it can also be graves so clinical parameters less reliable but the, the tests that we need to do are ft4 and tsh at diagnosis and follow up every 4 to 6 weeks so this is what we are trying try to maintain in the high normal range now a very another important topic which we will just touch a case of amiodarone in thyroid a 48 year old female on cordarone 200 mg for 2 years now she has been on cordarone for 2 years now she is complaining of weight gain lethargy and vague joint pains she is diagnosed to have primary hypothyroidism with a tsh of 18.5 and ft4 suppressed now what do we do कन्वर्जन so there is also direct thyroid cytotoxicity it affects the thyroid autoimmunity also there is interaction with the thyroid hormone receptors also and the, there are a little cut off uh, there are a little difference in the cut offs for a patient on cordarone for thyroid functions but interestingly remember that the tsh cut offs are same 
So we should always take into consideration the TSH cutoffs in patients on amiodarone, and you will find they are same. So if it is amiodarone-induced hypothyroidism, mostly it is seen in patients who already have underlying thyroid disability. The mechanism can be Wolff checkoff, it can be high Hashimoto's, and the treatment remains thyroxine replacement. We have to take off the cordyron, of course. Now, it can be autoimmune thyroiditis also. Amidaron can cause thyrotoxicosis also. If it causes the toxicosis, it can be type 1 or type 2. When, whether it is type 1 or type 2, we are not clinically sure, but the incidence is almost 1 to 23%. In both the conditions, it depends what, to, what are we dealing with, but we don't know what we are dealing with. In type 1, it is the increased serum iodine. So, gland starts increased serum hormones in uh, the hormone synthesis is increased. So type 1 simulates your Graves. As a result, there is in both type 1 and type 2 and even in hypo, both the underlying gland has to be diseased. It is already diseased, but it does not come to surface. It came to surface after starting cordyron or amiodarone. Now, if it is type 1, that is something like Graves, it is making more hormones. So you need antithyroid drugs. If it is type two, that is a picture of thyroiditis. There is destruction of the gland and whatever the synthesized glands are present, they were released. So you don't need antithyroid drugs. You only need steroids. But how to differentiate whether it is type one or type two? So maybe this is a, just a comedy that let's flip a coin and decide what it is. But no. <laughs> Yeah, that's just a joke, sir. But actually, we do not have any method to clinically differentiate type 1 and type 2. And we don't want a scan here. So what we do, if it is a hypothyroid, we treat with thyroxine replacement and we withdraw the amiodarone. But if it is a hyperthyroid, we are dealing with hypo. If, if it is a hyperthyroid, that is a TSH is suppressed, why either we go for frequent observation after withdrawing. And if it is thyroiditis, it will recover. If it is Type 1, that is a picture of simulating increased synthesis, it will require antithyroid drug and the patient will persist in the phase of hyperthyroidism. Or, or a second probability is you can treat for short time and follow up the patient because antithyroid drugs for a short time if the patient is really thyrotoxic will not harm you or harm the patient. So that is about amiodarone induced thyrotoxicosis. Type 1, you can treat with either uh, neomarcazole, that is thionamides or propyl thiuracil. Type 2, you treat with prednisolone, or you can treat as mixed type, because if it is a medical emergency, you can even go for a thyroidectomy. Coming to our another case, if we have time, we can take the last case maybe. Patients describing a cold intolerance with a poor memory and constipation, BP is normal, weight 60, height normal, thyroid is non-palpable. Do you think you will go for a thyroid profile in this patient? Should we ask for a thyroid profile? Yes, yes ma'am. Yes. 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 yes, yes, yes. Any any patient coming to us with a dry skin, dry skin. Cold intolerance, though the gland is non-palpable because goiter is not mandatory. So this is a recommendation of grade D that any symptom is suggestive of hypothyroidism because there are very vague symptoms, not very specific, unspecific symptoms are present, especially in women, especially postmenopausal. There's a very mixed picture, always rule out hypothyroidism. <coughs> Another picture, T3 1.3, T4 2, TSH 21. Simple diagnosis? Hypothyroidism. 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 Primary hypo hypothyroidism. And primary hypothyroidism. So primary hypothyroid, a very important slide. We all know we treat with thyroxine, but we never treat on the basis of TSH, please. Treat on the basis of body weight. And these are the recommendations. Age-wise, we are dealing with adults mostly because we do, uh, most of us are dealing with adults. So age-wise, always treat with 1.6 or 1.7 micrograms per kg per day. Do not treat if the TSH is 200, you do give a very high dose to a 50 kg women. Or if the TSH is 50 in a 100 kg women, you are dealing with a uh, lesser dose. Do not decide the dose on the basis of TSH report. Decide the dose on the basis of body weight. 
And then of course, on follow-up, you can titrate according to your TSH report. A patient gained 15 kgs weight in last year, weight 90, height 173, BMI 34. Gland is palpable, but the patient is euthyroid. TSH is 4.7. Antibody is negative. TSH after three months is just five and TPO negative. Patient is insisting my entire body weight I have gained because of thyroid. No. Gained 15 kg in one year. No. Do you think we should treat him? Obesity. No. It could no. be obesity. No, no. no. Levels. Correct. You don't no, please no. left in and obesity. That Very, way. We, should, we should revise the, the patient again. Uh, should be which road to travel? Treat or not to don't treat? treat. No, no, don't treat. treat. No. Weight reduction. Yes, no. See, we all remember our physiology class, second module. So we have to deal with the myths and truths every time. It is the leptin, the serum leptin, which is called increase, which is causing increased TSH. And this is not the hypothyroid induced obesity. It is obesity, obesity induced, induced hypothyroid. hypothyroid. So obesity and aging are two important reasons of subclinical hypothyroid. So this is uh, a case of a primary hypo six years back on replacement for six years. Two minutes. Okay. So the patient is complaining of low attitude, unwell, unable to lose weight, BMI 29, TSH 2. Already hypothyroid, six years on treatment, 75, BMI 29, TSH is 2. Not well, clinically still hypothyroid. Nothing to do with thyroxine should be done. Thyroxine. Pre thyroxine should be done. Very good. We are dealing with a case of missing something. We are missing the diagnosis. So maybe we are dealing with secondary hypothyroid. Orbs history gives us she had two full term normal deliveries. The second child is eight years, and she has not ever had a normal menstrual cycle after the second baby. Initially, she took it as lactational amenorrhea. Then she was on withdrawal cycles for a few years. And then finally, she forgot everything about cycles because the family was complete. So this is something that we are dealing with a pituitary suppression. TSH is normal. We ask for a complete profile and it comes out to be a low T3 with a low T4. And we are dealing with a low T3 and a low T4. So where are we? We are somewhere here. That is a case of secondary hypothyroidism. So we are here sure. to be hypothyroidism. Yeah. Should we go for cortisol level in this case, madam? We will do that, yes. sir. We will definitely yeah. do that. Because uh. now we are dealing with a Sheehan syndrome, that is empty cella. And we will go for a complete pituitary workup and the cortisol is low. LHFSH is also low. E2 is also low. Prolactin should have been raised. It could have been on the higher side. The electrolyte balance is normal because of the adrenal medulla, thanks to that. And as a result, hypocortisolism with a secondary hypogonadism, we are dealing with empty cella and we are dealing with a Sheehan syndrome. She will require pituitary hormone replacements. So this is a complete picture of secondary hypothyroidism. The excess will be G, G, T, A. Everything will be assessed. So can I take this case, ma'am? You allow me for... Madam, I've got one question about this. Uh, I, I think in any case where you are thinking Sian syndrome, uh, cortisol should be replaced first or hydrocortisol should be replaced first before the thyroxine, uh, thyroid hormones. Always replace the cortisol as a rule, sir. Yeah. Otherwise, you will precipitate an adrenal crisis. Yes, yes. That's, that's good. Well, I, we should not miss Sian syndrome as hypothyroidism and yeah. treat them. Absolutely, okay. sir. Ma'am, with your permission, can I take this case or should I uh, close it? Sure. Okay. So this and was. Are the you idea. asking me? You yeah, can take it. I was. It's between you and Dr. Keswani. Between you and Dr. Keswani. Keswani, sir. Yeah. Yes, you can finish with this after this. Okay. Maybe we'll just take this last case. So there's a lump in the neck. She saw it, but. There are no compressive symptoms, nor palpitation or any thyroid dysfunction. She was born in an area of iodine replete area. So it is not iodine deficiency, but on palpation, you find that there is a MNG. So you explore a thyroid functions here and you order a sonography. You find that the TSH is on the lower side and the TSH is, if the TSH is on the lower side, you ask for an uptake scan. 
and if it is normal you go for fnab this case i am taking just to tell you what are the usg findings which will uh, which are the strong pointers towards malignancy so if you go for a sonography if you ask your radiologist for a usg neck or a usg thyroid always look for these four points whether what is the status of hypoecogenicity look for the hypoecogenicity look for speculated margins of the nodule look for microcalcifications specifically look for the solid nodule what is the intranodular vascularity is the size taller than wide if the nodule is tall rather than wide it is more in favor of malignancy microcalcifications are in favor of malignancy macrocalcifications are surely in favor of very very specific for malignancy so any nodule sonography you are asking be sure what are you looking for you are looking for a solid nodule with speculated margins with macro calcification and a nodule which is taller than wide if you remember these four points your sonography will tell you that you are dealing with a malignant nodule of course fnac is always required so the pattern is for a nodule is always go for a biochemical assessment sonography fnac or biopsy molecular studies and then of course this is how you approach a nodule with that i close my uh, case studies thank you so much uh, for madam madam you. last question of this last case should we go for the true cut or the fnac because fnac good number of times gives up some false impression and we could not get that proper tissue and for prove it's a case of malignancy so it is better to go for a true cut rather than a fnac Yes, I, I always yeah. advise to go for a core biopsy if you are very strongly suspicious of your, of your malignancy. But do, don't we always first go for FNAC and then we are, if the FNAC comes die, doubtful, then we move to the true cut biopsy. That is the okay. protocol that we follow. But if okay. you jump FNAC, you can go for a true cut biopsy directly. Only thing is you will be subjecting more number of patients to true cut biopsy, which may might not be actually requiring it. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Minal. It was really a nice presentation, and it was uh, you have cleared so many things about the thyroid interpretation. How can we work various thyroid cases? And uh, this has made us uh, very wise. And I think everybody must have appreciated your uh, lecture. And uh, now we move further to today's next session. Excellent lecture, and, uh, Dr. Minal. Artists, we have. With case Thank discussion, uh, I mean, the things become more easy. Thank With you, every case, the things are clear, and you talk so, uh, you explain each and every point so nicely that I think it is very easy for all the clinicians to update their knowledge. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations to you. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Kaitan. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Minal. Thank you, Dr. Parikh. Now we move for the today's next session. That is for the male hypogonadism. And today we have very two, uh, two eminent endocrinologists from India, uh, best endocrinologists from the India. And one is Dr. Madhukar Mittal, who is professor of endocrinology at Ames, Jodhpur. He will be speaking about how various other diseases, including liver disease, renal disease, malignancies can also present as hypogonadism. Other is Dr. Rakesh Sai, who is again a stalwart of API and also president of Endocrine Society of India at present. And he will be talking about how environmental factors, exercise and obesity also can cause hypogonadism. So without wasting time, I invite Dr. Madhukar Mittal to please share the screen and start with uh, lecture. Dr. Madhukar Mattel is DM Endocrinology, Professor in Endocrinology at Ames, Jodhpur. Thank you, sir, for those kind words. Uh, thank you, Dr. Keswani, for having me here. <clears throat> and thank you, Dr. K.K. Parikh, sir, and Dr. Girish Mathur, uh, also for having me here. I hope my slides are visible to all. Yes, uh, they are visible. Right. So without wasting time, I've been given the task of talking about male hypogonadism uh, due to systemic disease and drugs. 
So uh, we have had a previous series on this, on uh, what is male hypogonadism and evaluation for male hypogonadism. So basically, uh, uh, it's a syndrome that results from failure of the testis to produce physiological levels of testosterone and or normal number of spermatozoa. And this is due to disruption of one or more levels of the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. Male reproduction as such is a complex process and numerous medical conditions have the potential to alter spermatogenesis and hormone production. And actually male reproduction uh, and hypogonadism may be a biomarker for systemic and future health. So that is why it is very important. The causes have been discussed previously. However, if you look at the causes of acquired causes, we will find a majority of the causes pertain to systemic conditions and various drugs. So like sickle cell disease, liver cirrhosis, alcohol intake, tuberculosis, hemochromatosis, sarcoidosis, use of opioids, glucocorticoids, and others. So I'll be taking this more in detail, but if you look at uh, these causes of systemic illness and drugs, what we find is that they create a mixed picture. That is, they lead to both primary and secondary hypogonadism. Primary hypogonadism is one where testosterone is low and the LH and FSH are high, the gonadotropins are high. Whereas secondary hypogonadism has low testosterone with low or inappropriately low gonadotropins. So a mixed picture is what is seen in these systemic disease conditions leading to male hypogonadism. So if you look at some specific conditions, this is not the complete list. We find uh, conditions like burns, stroke, traumatic brain injury, myocardial infarction, respiratory conditions, including chronic obstructive lung disease, sepsis, periods of surgical stress, cancer, chronic renal failure and chronic liver disease, rheumatoid arthritis, HIV, and commonly we deal with diabetes and obesity. So I leave out the obesity part because that's going to be taken in the next talk. But important to look at uh, in, is the clinical part where prepubertal and postpubertal hypogonadism have different presentations. And especially with regards to systemic disease occurring postpubertally in adults, we may be dealing with individuals having normal stature, normal secondary sexual characteristics, normal voice, but may just be presenting with infertility, decreased libido, maybe gynecomasia, uh, decreased muscle mass, and decreased uh, energy, having more fatigue and erectile dysfunction. So uh, the other aspect to remember with systemic conditions is that besides affecting testosterone overall, uh, they also affect what is known as sex hormone binding globulin. And this SHBG is what leads to decreased or increased bioavailable testosterone. And if it look at conditions with increased SHBG, we find high increased age, liver cirrhosis, hyperthyroidism, HIV infections, malnutrition, malabsorption, and use of estrogens and anticonvulsants. While for decreased SHBG, we have conditions like obesity, hypothyroidism, diabetes, nephrotic syndrome, and use of glucocorticoids and anabolic steroids. Get more in detail about the mechanisms for the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis being affected in systemic disease. Uh, we find that it's the testis producing testosterone which gets affected predominantly be it through systemic illness leading to inflammatory cytokine production like interleukin 1, 6, and TNF-alpha. Directly also it gets affected with the use of alcohol and drugs, chemotherapeutics like alkylating agents. However, weight loss per se leads to affecting the hypothalamus and pituitary. And from the CNS, we have endorphins, which inhibit the hypothalamus. And from the hypothalamus and pituitary, uh, we know that gonadotropins get secreted. So their production decreases and thus which affects testicular production of testosterone. So overall, this leads to dec uh, uh, decrease in lean body mass, decrease bone mineral density, 
symptoms of decreased libido, decreased energy and concentration and increased body fat. Uh, common comorbidities, and this is from the HIM study from the US, uh, where 2000 odd individuals were studied and it was seen that uh, individuals with hypogonadism, uh, uh, this was found that a higher odds ratio for increased prevalence of obesity, diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, bone osteoporosis, and chronic obstructive lung disease was found to be more common in these individuals with hypogonadism. And if you look at the endocrine society guidelines, this specifically mention certain conditions like infertility, osteoporosis or a low trauma fracture, type 2 diabetes, moderate to severe chronic obstructive lung disease, end stage kidney disease or patients on maintenance hemodialysis, HIV associated weight loss, and use of drugs like glucocorticoids, ketoconazole, opioids. So individuals on these drugs or with these conditions need to be specifically yeah. evaluated with the serum testosterone levels. Ah. Let's take some of these conditions. Okay. Uh, just okay, okay. a bit about diabetes mellitus, ah. where predominantly uh, individuals may have erectile and ejaculatory dysfunction due to neural or vascular pathologies, but also you have hypogonadotropic hypogonadism being found in 25% and another 4% having hypergonadotropic Achad. hypogonadism. So okay. hypogonadism okay. is common in males with diabetes. A urinary infection. I mean, I don't know. This was operated by the best surgeon. And we have subnormal okay. testosterone concentrations, which may and not be related to HbA1c or the duration of diabetes, were left behind. but you more commonly it. associated with obesity, I why there is so much higher inflammatory body. markers like CRP. Anyway, you and decided because anemia. yesterday urologist had come. This hypogonadism is also associated with a two to three so times increased like risk for Around cardiovascular events and death. And this testosterone treatment in these individuals can have a beneficial effect ah. in terms of glycemic control and increases libido. Ah. Ah. Coming to HIV okay. disease, okay. and this is from okay. a meta-analysis okay. published in okay. Cell okay. Journal recently, 2021, where the overall prevalence of testosterone deficiency yeah, in know. HIV infected men was found to be 26%. Ah. Is high. So one in four individuals. Ah. And if we look at how HIV yeah. infection leads okay. to hypogonadism, it affects both, uh, it leads to both primary as well as yeah. secondary hypogonadism. Yeah. And if you yeah. see yeah. in yeah. HIV yeah. disease, so malnutrition, within after admission within three days is voiced. Comorbidities, premature aging, oh. uh, the virus itself yeah. uh, is affected. So there is use of antiretroviral therapy, glucocorticoids, HCV co-infection, and at the level of testis, uh, it's uh, opportunistic infections, chronic inflammation, antiretroviral therapy, and also the viral infection per se. So together in HIV disease, we can have both primary as well as secondary hypogonadism. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. And besides the hypogonadism, what point. affects yeah. erectile dysfunction is the vascular impairment, peripheral neuropathy, and also various psychosocial issues with regards to the HIV diagnosis per se. So when these HIV infected men in the same meta-analysis was found that they were treated with exogenous testosterone, it led to a significant improvement, increase in body weight, lean body mass and fat-free mass in these individuals. So uh, this has just been published last year, 2021. Coming to chronic renal failure, where decreased libido, erectile dysfunction, and gynecomasia are again common with both primary and secondary gonadal failure. And this disturbance of the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis can be detected even at levels of moderate reductions in GFR. And this worsens as renal failure progresses. Even in acute renal failure, we can have transient decrease in testosterone levels due to the axis being affected, which is, however, reversible upon restoration of renal function. Liver disease serum testosterone has been shown to be reduced in around 90% of men with liver cirrhosis. 
the mechanisms have been central hypogonadism direct testicular injury from alcohol inflammatory cytokines interleukin 16 and tnf alpha and increased levels of sex hormone binding globulins coming to cancer hypogonadism is present both pre and post treatment in these individuals some examples in testicular cancer cancer more than 50% of men have been found to have oligospermia before treatment in uh, hodgkins disease approximately one third of patients have oligospermia and around 70% of men have abnormal semen analysis again the factors include malnutrition cancer cachexia systemic inflammation use of various drugs including chemotherapy and opioids chronic stress and the concomitant comorbid illnesses rheumatoid arthritis commonly seen in uh, physicians practice where low serum free or bioavailable testosterone and gonadotropin concentrations are seen in one in three individuals uh, factors again include the elevated pro inflammatory cytokine milieu uh, with complications such as rheumatoid lung and other organ failures treatment with glucocorticoids and drugs like methotrexate sulfasalazine and cyclophosphamide all contributing to this Uh, neurologic disorders commonly again have the same systemic uh, pathophysiological basis specific conditions like myotonic dystrophy where the testicular dysfunction is characterized by testicular atrophy increased gonadotropins and defective spermatogenesis so here we have low testo and high gonadotropins another condition spinal bus and bulbar muscular atrophy or what is known as kennedy syndrome where we have increased lh with normal testosterone so picture like testosterone resistance gynecomasia and clinical signs of androgen deficiency with small testis is present the disease severity in this condition is related to the cag repeats in the exon 1 of the androgen receptor respiratory disorders chronic obstructive lung disease uh, low testosterone prevalence ranges from 12 to 38% factors contributing here include muscle wasting inactivity malnutrition chronic stress use of steroids and importantly here hypoxia suppresses gonadotropin and testosterone secretion this is uh, this action is independent of the glucocorticoid therapy and this is specific to the chronic uh, lung disorders celiac disease this may manifest as androgen deficiency but here we have a picture of androgen resistance where we have high normal concentrations of total and free testosterone and high lh concentrations uh, there is loss of gi5 alpha reductase activity leading to low serum dihydrotestosterone despite high testosterone levels and treatment remains uh, as for celiac disease gluten restriction and this improves with dietary gluten Uh, restrictions coming to bit on drugs uh, a lot of drugs are there and i'll be touching upon some of them we have cytotoxic chemotherapies radiotherapy is part of the uh, uh, regimen for cancer uh, radio iodine ablation anti androgen use ketoconazoles 5 alpha reductase inhibitors use of certain sex steroids amiodarone was discussed in the previous uh, thyroid session statins hmg coa reductase inhibitors anti epileptics and substance abuse in the form of cannabinoids opioids and others so let's talk about a few cytotoxic chemotherapy uh, alkylating agents like cyclophosphamide and others they damage the testes directly particularly the seminiferous epithelium and leydig cell dysfunction is seen in 30% of men receiving chemotherapy for hematological malignancies now this effect of these various drugs including cyclophosphamide is dose dependent and can lead to severe oligospermia or uh, azoospermia now we have technologies of sperm banking available and before starting such chemotherapeutic regimens this option should be discussed with male uh, patients desirous of future fertility radiotherapy testis is a highly radio sensitive organ particularly the spermatogonia and pubertal leydig cells are more radio sensitive than post pubertal ones uh, x ray radiation in the doses of as low as 15 centigrade may suppress sperm production temporarily even cns irradiation disturbs the anterior pituitary function and can lead to affecting the gonadal axis coming to radio iodine therapy uh, 
of men treated with thyroid cancer produces dose dependent impairment of spermatogenesis and elevation of FSH up to around two years. So we give radio iodine therapy very frequently. So what is important is uh, protection and avoidance of scatter uh, in these individuals. So RAI transiently impairs both germinal and Leydig cell function, which usually recovers over 18 to 24 months. Permanent testicular germ cell damage may occur when treated with high dose, and this is for cancer patients. A bit about antiandrogens. We have both steroidal and non-steroidal antiandrogens available. Commonly, we use spironolactone in various conditions. Spironolactone <laughs> binds to both mineralocorticoid receptor and the androgen receptor, and it leads to a decline in testosterone biosynthesis and increase in circulating progesterone levels. Aromatization of testosterone to estradiol is also enhanced, and this is what leads to gynecomasia. And this effect is seen especially when we are using doses of around 200 milligrams per day of spironolactone. Other drugs, cimetidine, ranitidine, now less so used. We have uh, PPIs being used. But previously, uh, with these drugs, you had uh, larger doses. Could, uh, they led to gynecomasia, breast tenderness, and erectile dysfunction. Ketoconazole is a drug which is still used. It leads to Sir, your voice is not coming. Am I audible now? Because I think uh, the electricity went, so I've used yes. a hotspot. Am I audible again? Yes, yes, sir. Okay, so I'll continue. Yes, so I'm sorry. Hmm. Yeah, so I'm using a hotspot. I think uh, electricity went off. And I'm on power backup. So ketoconazole is another drug. Uh, which leads to a dose-dependent reduction in testosterone levels and also okay. leads to an increase in 17 hydroxyprogesterone levels. The gonadotropin levels, LH and FSH, also rise with the use of ketoconazole. Uh, the testosterone levels, when we test for it, may be normal when the ketoconazole is administered once daily because of short half-life and gonadotropins may be a pointer to the axis being affected. And high dose ketoconazole we know is uh, has is known to cause gynecomasia. Coming to five alpha reductase inhibitors, finasteride and deuteroide, commonly used in urology practice. Uh, finasteride is an inhibitor of type two five alpha reductase activity, also used in dermatology practice for balding. Uh, 5 milligram daily dose increases prostatic testosterone level sevenfold, but does not alter the same testosterone at all. So we are used frequently. Uterosteroid is a dual 5 alpha reductase inhibitor. It leads to a reduction in serum dihydrotestosterone by 93% and increased serum testosterone by 19%. And the levels remain within normal range after two years. So not a big concern with the use of these drugs commonly used. Uh, sex steroids, especially the anabolic steroids, which are used commonly in gyms and uh, people who undergo strength training used to enhance muscle strength. They lead to suppression of the male hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. Uh, Important thing to note here is that symptoms typically appear during the withdrawal phase of anabolic steroid use. That is after completing a course of their use. And so later on, pe uh, people will come or when we elicit a past history of having used these drugs. Characterized by decreased libido, erectile dysfunction, and sometimes depression. Uh, the symptoms may persist after the withdrawal of the androgens, as I mentioned. The severity and duration uh, and testosterone levels depend on the type and dose of steroids and the duration of use. We have various drugs like nandrolone and others being used. Spontaneous recovery takes time and may take more than four months or even longer in these individuals. Coming to progesterins and GnRH analogs. Chronic administration of high-dose progesterone such as magistrol acetate or medroxyprogesterone acetate uh, or even estrogens like diethyl stilbestrol, which was used in the past, affect testicular function and lead to decreased gonadotropins. GnRH agonists 
are used predominantly for metastatic prostate cancer. In fact, they are used to decrease the testosterone levels, so induce castration or near castration testosterone levels. So in fact, it's a therapeutic form of reducing testosterone levels. Amiodarone, which was talked about in the thyroid class, it is lipophilic. It also accumulates in the testis 50 times higher than in the serum. It leads to a sterile epididymitis, gynecomasia, and elevated serum gonadotropins. So this is another uh, side effect of amiodarone, uh, which we should be aware of in our practice. Anti-epileptic drugs like phenytoin and carbamazepine, they lead to increased sex hormone binding globulin levels, lower free or available testosterone levels, and more so when patients are on multiple drugs, the LH levels may be increased uh, due to the increased uh, decreased negative feedback of the uh, lowered free testosterone being there. A bit about substance abuse like cannabis, opioids, and others, they affect almost every part of the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. Uh, alcohol and opioids can lead to hyperprolactinemia. They, uh, they also affect the metabolism of testosterone. They inhibit steroidogenesis at the level of pituitary and below, and also lead to oxidative stress and apoptosis. So alcohol, cigarette smoking, even caffeine, cannabis, cocaine, all are known to affect some or the other part of this axis. So if you look at uh, these individually, we find that most of the substance abuse lead to decreased testosterone. It is only caffeine and cigarette smoking which leads to transient elevation of serum testosterone. Cannabis is uh, sort of not known whether it uh, sort of really affects the levels of testosterone, but overall the effect of all these substance abuse, they affect sperm concentrations, they reduce sperm concentrations. So the overall effect is negative by various hypothesized pathophysiologic mechanisms, and I'll not go into detail for this. Cannabis may increase, uh, increase libido in short term. However, chronic use diminishes erectile dysfunction in men. There is decrease in sperm count and concentration with uh, poor morphology, decreased motility and viability, and decreased fertilizing capacity. The effect on testosterone levels, as I said previously, is largely undetermined. However, LH levels, and FSH, uh, LH levels decrease and FSH levels remain unchanged. The extracts, the marijuana extracts may have contaminants with estrogenic activity and thus in males may have further deleterious effects. About the opioids, almost 90% of men experience erectile dysfunction or reduced libido. And due to the inhibitory action of morphine on GnRH secretion in the hypothalamus, we have a high incidence of subnormal total testosterone levels and this action is dose dependent. So the higher the dose, the more uh, are the chances of lower testosterone levels being there. A bit about critical illness and burn injuries. There is profound and prolonged hypoandrogenemia because of both combined central and testicular causes. In acute phase, you have Leydig cell dysfunction with rise in gonadotropins and prolonged suppression also affects the gonadotropins. So you have both decreased testo and decreased LH in the longer term. The decrease in serum testosterone has been inversely related to the degree of illness and the severity of major burns. So the extent determines the degree. Let's take a look at the approach because when we see these individuals, they comprise a significant or a major chunk of individuals presenting with hypogonadism. So functional hypogonadism, either due to systemic illnesses or drug abuse uh, affects the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. So the presentations may not be very striking in the form of absent secondary sexual characteristics. So we should be aware and especially look for or ask questions related to sexual desire, uh, spontaneous erections or nocturnal penile tumescence breast discomfort or gynecomasia, loss of or decrease of axillary pubic hair or reduced shaving. Uh, patients may come with uh, secondary infertility. There may be a history of height loss or low trauma fracture.
fracture or on screening somebody comes with a report of low bone mass uh, they may have reduced muscle bulk or may have even symptoms suggestive of what is parallel in females as hot flushes also sometimes they may complain of diminished physical or work performance with decreased energy and motivation a decreased aggressiveness which was there previously feeling depressed poor concentration memory decreased sleep or sleep disturbances uh, males having mild anemia with a systemic illness especially that may be a pointer or increasing body fat so these are all subtle pointers in these male patients where we should have a high index of suspicion and where we need to evaluate these patients obviously the evaluation is comprised of hormone testing if required pituitary imaging bone densitometry is required once hypogonadism is confirmed semen analysis genetic testing if we are thinking on those lines but systemic disease evaluation also so we do our testosterone levels just i'll end in a few slides a couple of things for testosterone levels highest levels are during early morning hours we know they are affected by these illnesses and uh, drugs so we need to test them in the morning so the best time for testosterone is between 8 to 10 or maximum 11 am after that there is a circadian rhythm where they may be falsely low also sometimes with the older assays we needed a pooled sample of lh done 20 30 minutes apart but with newer assays single tests can be done so what do we interpret how do we interpret in acute catabolic states like burn severe trauma major surgery we are likely to get low testosterone and low gonadotropins in chronic systemic illness obesity severe weight loss we can get low or no normal testosterone with a normal lh and fsh while with increased age 75 85 years and beyond we get low or low normal testosterone with normal to high gonadotropins so the approach lies similar to what we deal for primary conditions where functional hypogonadism needs to be treated however the treatments need to be individualized based on the underlying systemic illness so suppose you have a chronic liver disease you will probably not like to use oral testosterone where it affects the liver or has liver metabolism so uh, these conditions need to be borne in mind suppose an individual with chronic illness does not require fertility that is not an approach which you would like to take so individualized approach and obviously withdrawal of substance abuse and drugs if possible a bit of caution here of what is known as a sick eugonadal syndrome so we give pharmacological therapy only and only if it is likely to show benefit in these individuals and if we look at what systemic illnesses have been shown to have definite benefit with the use of uh treatment for hypogonadism we find uh cancer chronic opioid exposure diabetes and obesity hiv disease have shown there's a great strength of benefit in terms of fatigue sexual function glycemic control in diabetes lean body mass in hiv also we have a grade 3 level of evidence for burn injuries chronic obstructive lung disease chronic renal failure and even rheumatoid arthritis so there's a host of conditions where studies have been done and found to be beneficial so and we did need to decide whether uh, the patient requires restoration of se sexual function or it is basically for systemic benefits so we need to tailor our testosterone treatment and keep in mind that testosterone treatment is not only for the male sexual organs per se but also for increasing muscle strength stimulation of erythropoietin production from the kidney helping anemia uh, bone marrow stimulation and bone strength so that is where i would like to end hopefully i have stuck to my the time given to me thank you thank you dr madhukar you have really made it very detailed lecture that any patient who comes to with to us for the hypogonadism is not because of the testes or pituitary deficiency but we have to keep in our mind a number of other systemic diseases can cause can present as hypogonadism including liver disease renal failure including rheumatoid arthritis and even patients who are taking anabolic androgens they can present it so we have always keep in our mind
these things can present with the hypogonadism and it was a very nice and informative lecture any questions if there are please you are most welcome. can i make one question sure sir. You, yes sir your voice is not coming sir you, dr shubendu you are you are un, 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 uh, can you hear me now yes uh, so uh, dr madhukar congratulation for a nice lucid lecture and i think we have learned a lot now we are now seeing in part of calcutta at least a good number of patients having bilateral epididymal orchitis and quite a few of them has been proved to be a case of chlamydia infection and once i treat them patient with a long term doxycycline or uh, azithromycin so they are improved and their testosterone level become nearly normal what's your idea about bilateral because globally this is one of the important causes of bilateral testicular uh, infection or bilateral epididymal orchitis this uh, though it's less common than your filaria but this is gaining an importance as an infective cause of epididymal orchitis which is to a great extent treatable what is your idea sir do you have any cases like this or thank you thank you sir for your compliments and for your question so epididymal orchitis is a very common local condition or localized chronic infection leading to affecting both the uh, testicular function in terms of hormone production and in terms of uh, uh, semen production so both in terms of fertility and gonadal axis but gradually with time so definitely there are lots of cases which we come across but over the years the numbers are thankfully decreasing and yes you are very right that doxycycline remains a good treatment for these condition the important thing to note here is that the infection keeps transmitting bet between the male and female partner so it is important to treat both the male and female partner together yes sir thank you very much friends please Now, what is the relation of testosterone with the uh, new onset diabetes mellitus is there any uh, any uh, reason like this that decreased testosterone can produce or can uh, involve uh, i mean make a person diabetes who are prone to develop diabetes low testosterone can do that do that mm -hmm. this is shown in various studies where primary hypogonadism or even hypogonadotropic hypogonadism both conditions are associated with uh, insulin resistance so insulin resistance is the predominant factor here however diabetes per se also manifests in around 15% of these individuals treatment with gonadal therapy so with testosterone therapy or improving the hypogonadism leads to improvement in these insulin resistance and even sort of reduces the uh, glycemia if it is present in a certain number of these individuals so per se at onset with gonadal failure we can have definitely increased insulin resistance and even in some individuals mild hyperglycemia thank you sir thank you dr madhukar for your nice uh, lucid presentation i think it has it will be it will prove useful to majority of our participants now we move for the our second talk of the male hypogonadism thank you sir we have thank well you welcome we have another very eminent endocrinologist from india and he is dr rakesh sahay he is president of endocrine society of yes. india and he again will be giving a knowledge how are the many other factors environmental factors and obesity and even exercise can cause hypogonadism so dr rakesh will you please join us yeah uh, thank you thank you dr keshwani thank you for inviting me to be here in this uh, in this uh, important session and i also would like to extend my thanks to dr uh, dr parik dr kk parik dr girish mathur dr subind shibendu ghosh who are here uh, yeah meeting so i would uh, and i would also thank dr madhukar mittal for 
making my job very easy. He has uh, actually given us a very good approach. So I won't be discussing about the approach because he has actually very nicely uh, spoken about the approach. How you need how you need to uh, approach a patient with hypogonadism. Where do you look for these functional causes? He has he has uh, shown us this broad category of functional causes where. Uh, where he has discussed about the systemic diseases and drugs i'll be discussing about the physiological factors like you know environmental it's not exactly physiological but environmental factors obesity and how excise and all these factors are are going to dietary factors are going to affect the uh, uh, gonadal function so i'll let me share my slides is my slide visible yeah 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 so i'll be discussing uh, mostly about uh, how environmental factors are actually now influencing uh, hypogonadal function exercise and obesity are the other major uh, other major uh, aspects that i'll i'll quickly cover on uh, and their effect on gonadal functions so as dr madhukar mittal has highlighted uh, very nicely in his previous presentation uh, we are saying that you know when we want to understand uh, where the influence of a particular agent is coming whether it is drugs whether it is whether it is the systemic illness we need to understand whether it is at the level of the testis when it is when you call it as a primary hypogonadism where where uh, where you would find that the testosterone levels will be low but in that at the same time you would find an elevation in the lh and fsh levels but if the lh and fsh levels are are normal that is inappropriately normal for the low testosterone or they are low then it is uh, then it is then it then the effect is at the hypothalamic level so when we are dealing with uh, you know the primary gonadal disorders then you you know you have this very clear classification whether it is a primary uh, whether the problem is at the testicular level whether it is at the at the level of the hypothalamus but in all these situations that we are discussing today all the functional hypogonadism although most of them are affecting the hpg axis or affecting the affecting at the level of the hypothalamo uh, hypothalamo pituitary axis but uh, many of them have direct testicular effects also so there's a mixed effect and many of them have mixed effects as he has very nicely shown in his uh, presentation he has shown, shown about all the you know different uh, ways in which uh, systemic illnesses affect the gonadal function and also the way the drugs affect and many of them have 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 you know effects at both the levels so uh, classically as uh, he has also shown in his presentation you know, uh, that uh, you know when the when shbg levels go up with aging and uh, you can see that the they they mirror the free t4 levels rather uh, free testosterone levels and uh, you can see that there's a, there's a slow decline in in the testosterone levels although there's no rapid fall as happens with uh, happens in females where you have a uh, a sudden decline in the estrogen levels as at uh, at uh, menopause you do not have a a classical andropause but you have but if you look at the at the picture and you see that at 18 and and compare it with uh, with uh, with uh, a person at the age of 80 there's a there's a almost a uh, a, a a 50% decline 50 to 60% decline in the testosterone levels with age and when you look at the diagnosis of hypogonadism also again there's a lot of there, there is some controversy between you know what level should be used uh, for diagnosing uh, hypogonadism as you can see the endocrine society in 2010 uh, proposed a cut off level of around 300 Uh, while other associations like the european association of urology all the or the andrology uh, the european academy of andrology have used levels of 350 as the cut off for uh, defining hypogonadism and uh, there was another expert opinion which you used a cut off of 400 of the total testosterone for defining uh, for defining hypogonadism now coming to measurement of free testosterone it may be helpful in some situations but the issue is that the way the test is done in many of the labs is not uh, uh, appropriate in the sense that uh, uh, doing it by by lcms method would be the gold standard for for measurement of free testosterone then you would uh, then you would get a good uh, uh, assay whereas uh, because of these fallacies you would prefer to use the free testosterone uh, sorry total testosterone rather than measurement of free testosterone should not be uh, preferred in our set, uh, in the set in the current setup now uh, the consequences of hypogonadism have been very well discussed uh, in the previous presentation 
and uh, we uh, it could it could be it may not be with uh, very florid manifestation but it could be just just uh, just manifestations in the form of uh, depression uh, ma uh, low energy levels sleep disturbances and uh, decreased physical performance so these could also be there while they could be a decreased libido sexual dysfunctions and uh, and in those who are trying to uh, con i mean uh, father a child you may find that they may they may be, they may go for tests to look at their sperm sperm counts and you may find that they, they may be uh, abnormalities in spermatogenesis muscle mass decrease and uh, loss of bone mineral density these are all subtle signs which can help us in detecting hypogonadism now uh, this table again similar to the one which uh, dr madhukar mittal was speaking about you are seeing the effect of uh, effect of environment and lifestyle factors on uh, on 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 uh, uh, the hypo and on causing hypogonadism where are they affecting whether it is affecting the um, testicular level at the testicular level uh, where there is low testicular testosterone concentration and high fsh and lh concentrations or this is a these are the situations where these are the conditions which are affecting the um, causing secondary hypogonadism that is affecting the hypothalamus pituitary uh, axis and uh, gonadal axis and causing uh, at the at the level of the hypothalamus or pituitary and causing causing uh, hypogonadism while there is a combined effect in all these uh, conditions like uh, uh, we are speaking about alcohol we are speaking about smoking now and radiation aging sickle cell disease all of them can have a combined effect uh, conditions like diabetes predominant, predominantly you see the effect is on the on the uh, is towards causing secondary hypogonadism and then you have uh, drugs several drugs which act uh, at the at the hypothalamic level and then you have a lot of a host of other conditions which could have effect on the on on the uh, testicular at the testicular level but there are there are a lot of conditions which have a effect over at both the levels as as has been highly illuminated earlier so what i am going to discuss today is the environmental uh, effects of uh, uh, the various environmental factors which have an effect on the gonadal function uh, going through most of these which are shown in this picture as you can see that it could be just the stress it could be uh, disturbed circadian rhythm it could be smoking alcohol intake it could be illicit drugs it could be uh, pesticides which are present in the environment uh, which could be coming in through uh, inhalation through uh, skin contact or through various uh, other sources uh, even through the food or through the um, uh, through the vegetables and fruits that we are eating it could be through the air pollution it could be the radiation coming from uh, sources like i mean we, uh, dr mittal discussed about uh, radiation from x rays and uh, and other therapeutic radiation he spoke about radioactive iodine uh, therapy but leaving that aside i mean even just radiation coming from in the environment that is coming from cell phones or from microwaves at home this could have an effect on the on the gonadal function and uh, then uh, other uh, improper heating habits and nutritional insufficiencies all those are also going to be. so starting with the, the dietary uh, factors which can in, in influence uh, gonadal function uh, we all know that uh, a balanced nutrition is very imperative for reproductive health inappropriate dietary habits like poor uh, or excess calorie intake or very low calorie intake uh, can can lead to uh, in, uh, can have an impact on the gonadal function and uh, as you can see uh, a negative energy balance is often associated with uh, hypogonadism prolonged undernutrition decreased food intake and similarly when you have excess food intake uh, with obesity which i am going to discuss a little more in detail that is also going to have an effect now coming to pesticides uh, we have a lot of pesticide pesticide use and a uh, lot of effects because of pesticides um, and the organophosphorus pesticides which uh, uh, which uh, have an effect on on uh, causing on the sperm uh, spermatogenesis they reduce the sperm counts cause morphological abnormalities in sperm uh, sperm uh, function and they also decrease the testosterone levels as well as the F, as well as the fsh and lh levels where were seen to be low in in rats uh, when they giving uh, given at high doses showing that they had effect both at the testicular level at the hypothalamic level and uh, so we see that they have a significant effect even uh, and when when they were uh, when uh, pregnant women were exposed to pesticides it found that their male child male chil children who were conceived developed cryptorchidism low penile length testosterone deficiency and hypogonadism later in life so they 
uh, the pesticides act as endocrine disruptors they can be exposure to pesticides through diet inhalation or skin contact uh, and as we know that uh, uh, intake of fruits and vegetables with high residual pesticide concentration can also be a factor contributing towards the uh, towards the exposure to pesticides now uh, this uh, cartoon shows us uh, that uh, if you look at the organochloride chloride pesticides uh, they have anti androgenic or estrogenic activities ddt has potent uh, potent anti androgenic uh, activities now if you look at uh, imidacloprid it has effect uh, it has it has uh, a uh, effect on on uh, in, on the uh, on the hypothalamic level uh, at the pituitary level causing lh and F, uh, fsh uh, uh, fun- i mean uh, production is decreased and thereby reduces testosterone levels and it decreases the occurrence of hypogonadism or androprosin in test subjects so it has a a combined effect at both the levels now if you look at radiation we are speaking about radiation radiation has a marked uh, effect on on the male reproductive system and uh, we were speaking about external beam ir- irradiation radioactive iodine used in as therapeutically for for maybe in low doses when it's used for treatment of graves or in high doses when it's used for treatment of thyroid cancers uh, that has been discussed by dr uh, madhukar mittal but but if you look at uh, you know uh, radi- uh, microwave uh, radiations which can be coming from from either the, you know the the cell phones or it could be coming from cooking devices like the microwave ovens that we used or it may be from medical diathermy ep- equipment uh, or it can be from radars so all of them have uh, a significant effect on testicular function and can cause hypo uh, can cause decrease in uh, decrease in uh, in testosterone levels and also have an effect on the spermatogenesis they as as i was mentioning that they have a significant effect on the spermatogenesis also they they uh, deplete the they suppress the sperm production and deplete the type a spermatogonia in dose dependent fashion and elevated radiation levels are associated with increased frequency of random mutations in the azospermic factor abc region of the y chromosome so thereby they have far reaching effects now apart from that heat also has a significant effect on spermatogenesis as we all are aware spermatogenesis uh, uh, happens at uh, happens at it, uh, when the testosterone uh, when the testes are at a maintained at a temperature which is 2 to 4 degrees below the core body temperature and when the when this temp- when the temperature in the testes is elevated it results in increased apoptosis of the germ cells and increased dna damage so endogenous sources of elevated testicular temperature include obesity varicoceles fever and cryptorchidism so all these could be uh, factors which can lead to increased testicular uh, temperature and uh, the external sources i mean the environmental uh, factors which can cause uh, increase in temperature of the at the of the testes are you know uh, indulging in frequent saunas or hot tubs and prolonged usage of laptops particularly when they kept on the on the lap and used typically you are calling it as laptop it is meant to be used on the lap if it's kept on the table it is uh, it is probably all right but when it's kept on the lap and used then you tend to have a lot of heat generation which is increasing the testicular temperature alcohol has been mentioned in the previous presentation and uh, been know that it has an effect on the hpg axis uh, by directly affecting the leydig and sertoli cells of the testis and it impairs the spermatogenesis causes azoospermia also in some situations and uh, the uh, so there, therefore we see that there is uh, testicular atrophy reduced libido impotence decreased semen volume and altered sperm morphology and al- alcohol through its effect on the liver also can have you know causing liver disease again interferes with the with the test uh, with the gonadal functions then you see air and water pollution also has a significant effect effect on on uh, uh, gonadal functions so exposure to polluted air affects the sperm uh, motility morphology and dna integrity and this is something which has been uh, studied ext- i mean studied in the recent uh, few years and lot of uh, literature is there on on the effect of pollu- air pollution on uh, sperm counts and this has been uh, reported in the la- in, in, even in the general press also uh, water pollution also due to use of disinfectants 
can lead to uh, can have effect on the gonadal functions and uh, persistent uh, i mean uh, and it can be also through the water contamination of uh, by pesticides can also be a, a important effect on on uh, gonadal functions then uh, metals like nickel which is also seen in uh, air i mean in the air we find that uh, it can serve as a endocrine dis, uh, disruptor it has a potential to cause hypogonadism and it raises the lh fsh levels and lead to development of more than uh, more than one sexual disorder apart from all the things that we discussed about noise pollution also has been found to have a significant impact on uh, on testicular function it can cause testosterone def deficiency in rodent studies where uh, rodents have been exposed to a noise level of 100 decibel or more uh, it was found that they tend to have testosterone deficiency so noise noise exposure can work through different mechanisms it can even cause psychological distress and that can interfere with the hpg axis uh, or it could be because of um, uh, it could be other effects that can happen directly because of the i mean uh, 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 through the various effects that we are seeing here now uh, the other uh, factors like tobacco consumption which is becoming quite popular uh, i mean in the sense that uh, I, I would say that uh, you know a lot of uh, non smoking tobacco use has also increasing that is increasing while smoking levels have not increased in the recent past or maybe at uh, maybe um, uh, come down a little bit but uh, non smoke tobacco i mean in the sense uh, the use of uh, chewable tobacco and various other forms of tobacco has also has increased in the recent uh, few years and that has a significant effect on on uh, uh, the gonadal function particularly it has an effect on spermatogenesis decreases the sperm concentrations decreases motility and, and also affects the uh, morphology of this uh, of the sperms and uh, so mo uh, smoking more than 20 cigarettes per day has been shown to decrease the eject ejaculate volume uh, in in men smokers have lower amounts of spermatozoa as compared to men who have never smoked and uh, smokeless tobacco as as mentioning has also a significant effect on spermatogen spermatogenesis in a dose dependent fashion so uh, the if when you look at smoking itself it can have apart from the tobacco itself it, it can be the cadmium and lead levels in the smoke the relative hypoxia within the testis the polycyclic, uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons can lead to mutagenesis uh, apoptosis and dna fragmentation so it can have you know far reaching uh, genetic and epigenetic effects also now moving from uh, smoking to a more commonly consumed uh, product like caffeine which can be found in tea coffee or even chocolates it also has an effect on uh, on spermatogenesis it uh, has been uh, seen that uh, it can result in a subtle subtly cell only pattern in seminiferous tubules in mice who have been fed with high doses of caffeine in a study done on in danish military military recruits high doses of cola also at least 32 ounces per day cause a significant decrease in their sperm concentrations and and the quality of sperms so caffeine in any form can have an effect on the spermatogenesis now uh, looking at uh, dairy consumption also uh, if you look at dairy consumption of more than more than three servings per day is harmful to sperm quality and it results in 25 percent reduction in the speed of motile sperm cells and poorer morphology the reason why this happens is probably because of the phytoestrogen content uh, in cow's milk which is responsible for this uh, effect on the sperm quality other environmental factors like uh, xenobiotics peps, peps, pesticides chlorinated pollutants and heavy metals in the water and feed provided to the cows could also contribute to the problem so dairy products also can have a um, impact excessive consumption of dairy products because of the because of the phytoestrogens and uh, uh, and similarly you could have uh, effects of uh, phytoestrogens coming through uh, consumption of soy products and uh, because of the increase in estrogen and testosterone ratio they can lead to oligospermia then even phthalates uh, which are uh, 
found in uh, which are obtained from plastic containers can have a can have anti androgenic properties and they have been these properties have been shown in animal studies and even in human studies they, they have been shown to have these properties they are positively associated with serum estradiol levels and they alter the estradiol by testosterone ratio they are negatively associated with serum testosterone levels and sperm counts so, now coming to some other factors like the illicit drugs this has actually been covered by dr madhukar mittal so i'll uh, very briefly look at this uh, briefly go through this so he has spoken about how mari marijuana has an effect cocaine opiates he has spoken about the opiates and also methadone and naloxone analoxo- so i'll not go into details of this he has uh, already discussed this in detail and uh, i will come to the issue about androgenic anabolic steroids so these are these are these are commonly used bodybuilding uh, uh, in people who are doing a lot of exercise and trying to uh, you know build their muscle mass and they have been using this in many of the gyms and uh, other uh, uh, such places so these are these are uh, these lead to supra physiological uh, levels of uh, i mean testosterone can lead to hypogonadotropic hypogonadism they, they impair the spermatogenesis and can cause azoospermia as dr mittal has already pointed out this and even the use of testosterone exogenous testosterone can have an effect on on uh, the uh, uh, spermatogenesis and can actually impair spermatogenesis because of the suppression of the hypothalamic pituitary axis now exercise has is another important uh, influencer of uh, gonadal function uh, excessive exercise can 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 have this uh, negative impact and uh, we know that exercise as such has uh, has uh, important health benefits and uh, it's a it's a it's a good uh, uh, preventive adjunct for healthcare adjunct but but uh, there are a lot of positive physiological effects which we know that exercise has enhances the uh the uh the cardiac functioning it improves the blood volume increases the blood volume and hemos- hemoglobin concentrations increases the maximal av oxygen differential it increases the erythrocytosis decreases the levels of stored adiposity improves thermoregulatory capacity increase skeletal muscle mitochondrial density so all these benefits are there with exercise but uh, but <coughs> but what we see is that uh, uh, but what we see is that uh, when there is over reaching exercise then can, that can have uh, then that that can particularly in, in uh, people who are going into competition sports there can be effect on uh, a negative effect on the gonadal functions this is what uh, we would be discussing that uh, there is uh, if you look at uh, in female athletes you find that there is frequent secondary amenorrhea and that is occurring because of because of factors like uh, factors like uh, Uh, a low energy i mean they are, they are because of the disordered eating in those uh, in them and 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 also because of the hypothalamic function being affected and they have a have a significant uh, a negative effect on the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis and that can lead to secondary amenorrhea in, in female athletes so this is a common occurrence in female athletes a similar overtraining syndrome can be can also occur in male uh, male uh, athletes and uh, this can lead to uh this can lead to uh, increased likelihood of i mean neuroendocrine system is affected and its regulation is extremely sensitive to the stress of exercise training so we have the typical exercise hypogonadal male where there is chronic exposure to endu- endurance exercise training which t- leads to development of alterations in the reproductive hormone profile which happens very clearly in uh, in women it is seen as secondary amenorrhea but in men also it is it is it is, it exib- exhibits as uh, clinically uh, normal concentrations of testosterone but the concentrations are uh, are in the extremely low normal range so they may not go below 300 or below 250 but they are they are in the very low normal range there is increased risk of abnormal spermatogenesis infertility problems and compromise in bone mineral density so while exercise within the physiological limits is is good for improving the bone density but overtraining can actually have uh, can lead to these problems so uh what we see is that uh, long in 
long distance runners who have been involved in exercise training for for many months for more than one year up to 25 years in them it has seen that the uh, testosterone levels have been have been only 40 to 75 percent of the levels found in age match sedentary control so they have been in the lower normal range uh, not very low but in the lower normal range and uh, these are often complicated by the fact that uh, dr mittal has shown us the how the circadian rhythm have, uh, is is resp- i mean is important and we need to uh, see that we take the sample early in the morning and rather than uh, taking a random sample so some of these studies have had random samples taken at one only one sample but but uh, in studies where multiple st- samples have also been taken there also it has been shown that in these ex- uh, extremely uh, i mean these uh, individuals who are who are engaged in extreme exercises there is a reduction in the uh, in the values of testosterone level so these hypo uh, these the hormonal abnormalities noted in exercise hypogonadal men are reduction in testosterone levels lack of significant elevation in the basal lh in correspondence with the in with the substantially reduced testosterone levels indicating that there is a, a, a effect on the at the hypothalamic level LH secretory pulse pulse stability discrepancies have been noted and significant reduction in prolactin concentrations have also been noted in these uh, these uh, males who have been uh, indulging in extreme exercises particularly in in the uh, in the uh, competitive sports so as we said that uh, there could be acute transient phenomena or there could be a chronic phenomena of adaptation and that leads to a lower testosterone levels because of the uh, reduced uh, activity of the hp hp g axis that is the hypothalamus pituitary gonadal axis and what we see is typically i mean it's the male athlete triad also is described where you find that uh, there is low calculated free testosterone levels the prevalence of this could be up to about 80% of of uh, of uh, athletes could be showing a low uh, free testosterone levels but when you look at the do- total testosterone levels less than 300 uh, the prevalence is about 30 percent of these men who are indulging in uh, who are uh, involved in uh, extreme exercises so this can lead to um, significant effect on spermatogenesis such as, such as reduction in sperm density decreased motility increased um, abnormal you know, morphology and decreased penetration rates of the sperms and they could also have low sex drive and low bone mineral density so these are the implications of the uh, exercise induced hypogonadism that can happen with uh, in these uh, exercise hypogonadal men moving from there to obesity uh, quickly about a little about obesity obesity is characterized by as we know accumulation of excess body fat which has detrimental health outcomes which we all know sir and your voice is not clear yeah my voice is not clear. okay i'll be a little louder yeah thank you sir as we know obesity is associated with uh, a variety of uh, a variety of problems uh, health problems uh, be it uh, the occurrence of metabolic disorders like type 2 diabetes hypertension coronary artery disease cardiovascular disease and a host of cancers are caused because of obesity but it also has an effect on on uh, the sleep and it has an effect on pituitary hormone hormones particularly lh fsh secretion are influenced by by obesity the satiety hormones like leptin glp1 are affected by are are influenced by obesity and it can also have a significant effect on sexual function and contribute to infertility so we know that metabolic syndrome is characterized by by the uh, con- conglomeration of all these uh, normalities and i am not going to go into guys have been correct down here that what i would what i would like to say is that so metabolic syndrome has a significant impact on on the uh, reproductive function it can uh, it, it uh, does this by different ways one is through the uh, insulin resistance which has an effect on the shbg synthesis uh, which 
uh, and then there is a reduction in free to total testosterone which results in altered spermatogenesis a redu reduction in the gonadotropin uh, functions and also peripherally it is also increased aromatase activity in the adipose tissue which leads to altered androgen to estrogen ratio so through all these mechanisms uh, metabolic syndrome has a significant impact on or obesity induced metabolic syndrome has an impo effect on the on the uh, on the gonadal functions so this actually uh, summarizes very well how obesity has a significant impact on the reproductive functions so there uh, it can lead to uh, insulin resistance uh, which again has an effect on the on the shbg levels and thereby affects the testosterone levels and it can also have an effect on the aromatase activity increases the aromatase activity and thereby increases the conversion of testosterone to estradiol so uh, obesity uh, through the various uh, cytokines the adipose cytokines can have an impact on on uh, on uh, uh, the reproductive functions it can have an effect on uh, on uh, by increasing the erectile dysfunction increasing the scrotal temperature about which we have just spoken about it can increase the sleep apnea it can have an effect on on uh, uh, the, s the sperm quality and the sperm volume semen volume and it can also have an effect through uh, increasing through the insulin resistance leading to in increase insulin levels increase leptin levels decrease in testosterone and increase in estrogen estrogen levels so obesity has these effects uh, through different mechanisms it is influencing the gonadal function so uh, this cartoon actually tells us how uh, obesity is i mean lot of environmental factors are contributing to obesity and obesity itself is contributing to gonadal function i mean is affecting fertility and uh, and uh, um, and uh, the uh, gonadal function through uh, several different mechanisms that is uh, through the increase in scrotal te temperature the uh, the adipose cytokines having a impact impact on germ cell apoptosis increased sperm dna fragmentation altered semen parameters through all these mechanisms obesity is uh, having a significant impact on on gonadal function so i'll skip through a couple of these slides because uh, i am uh, i mean these have been uh, clearly described in the in the picture that i have uh, the in the cartoon that i have shown how uh, through various adipose cytokines whether it is the looking at the insulin level increase insulin increase insulin resistance there is effect on shbg levels the effect on leptin levels which have a significant uh, effect on on uh, the other hormonal value and then the the effect on on uh, resistin which is again another another uh, important obesity related adipose cytokine which has been uh, which has been uh, extensively studied in the last few years and uh, the through ghrelin which also has an impact on on uh, steroidogenesis and and the testosterone levels through all these mechanisms uh, obesity influences the hpga axis uh, and also affects the spermatogenesis and uh, it has a significant impact on sperm quality and also in the sperm dna and integrity and certainly is a, a, a obese men have a almost a one and a half fold increased chance of developing erectile dysfunction and the mechanisms are all all uh, discussed as as i've discussed there it could be because of decreased testosterone levels it could be because of the systemic inflammatory condition uh, of increased inflammatory cytokines and uh, endothelial dysfunction through the nitric oxide pathway all of them contribute to the erectile dysfunction which happens in obesity so as as i was mentioning that obesity uh, leads to a significant uh, inflammatory state which can have a effect on various organs uh, hypothalamic inflammation muscle inflammation cardiac and vascular inflammation liver inflammation and also uh, we are speaking speaking about testicular inflammation and and inflammation in the at the level of the seminal fluid all these having far reaching effects so with that i will conclude uh, because uh, the approach has been very clearly discussed in the previous uh, presentation where 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 uh, dr madhukar has very clearly highlighted that when you are dealing with uh, any of these symptoms you need to assess the uh, assess the test i mean assess for uh, for gonadal i mean for hypogonadism look at the testosterone levels know when to do it and also when you when you interpret the levels you need to look at all these uh, these environmental influences which can have an effect 
and also look at the drugs or systemic disorders which could be influencing the testosterone levels and treat appropriately and he has very clearly highlighted in all the conditions that i have i have uh, mentioned here they do not require treatment uh, with uh, with uh, testosterone therapy but it requires uh, alteration in the in the physiological i mean in the environmental factors trying to bring about uh, a alteration in that and uh, and uh, thereby overcome the influence of these factors so with that i will conclude i thank you all for the patient hearing and uh, thank dr prakash keshwani for giving me this opportunity i'll be happy to answer any questions thank you i'll stop sharing my screen dr prakash is here dr prakash can i make a question to dr rakesh sahar yes, please sir yeah uh, i am seeing a lots of patients of i uh, mean uh, in calcutta particularly who are basically true vegans they do not eat anything which is known as non veg non veg okay so they do not take any non veg food probably their lifetime and a large percentage of patient uh, when we do the blood test for b12 level they are very low and quite a significant percent of patient particularly young sexually active patients they develop uh, a, a, a condition of low vitamin b12 with low sperm count and i am seeing that after giving b12 this sperm count both in their quality and quantity are increasing once i start this b12 injectable form what is your idea and uh, about this type of condition do you think that is a you see also this way your opinion about this conditions b12 yeah. Ajuspermia, testicular size, arms count, quality and quantity. Yeah, yeah. It could uh, be not only the B12 but also the other environmental uh, factors which are coming into play. Uh, that could also be contributing. But B12 also is important. B12 is, uh, as we know, is very important in uh, mul rapidly multiplying cells. So if you're looking at the sperm quality, sperm count, that is influenced by the low B12 levels and uh, supplementation with B12, as you said. Uh, has uh, been shown to have a significant benefit thank you dr rakesh your lecture was really eye opening when a patient comes to us with the history suggestive of hypogonadism or ed we directly prescribe for lh and testosterone we do not take so much in many history that which kind of exercise he is doing what kind of other pollutions noise pollutions he has been exposed to and so many other things we have to think before finding out a cause for hypogonadism and it, it was a really a nice lecture very informative lecture eye opening lecture and uh, you and both uh, dr madhukar mittal both have done a very good job for making us uh, wiser that we do not have to jump for the lh and testosterone and testosterone replacement but we have to think of so many other causes of hypogonadism thank you dr rakesh thank you dr mittal for your nice uh, presentation very informative lectures any other questions so yeah just come uh, again yeah so again the for the next sessions after two weeks we will meet at 2 pm on the 17th of july and dr sk singh from institute of medical sciences bhu and dr sujoy ghosh from the kolkata will be giving lecture on the male hypogonadism and till then we can now wind up and thank you again dr mittal dr rakesh sahib for your thank you sir for inviting us uh, to this program thank you very much thank you sir thank you welcome sir dr pokas can i make a uh, make an request to you yes uh, do you have the recorded lectures of the program